<laughs> Welcome to the Wednesday, March 20th meeting of the Community Preservation Committee. And happy spring. I think yeah, it's the first hour. hour. <laughs> yeah. Is that right? I think it started officially at 6 o'clock. Yeah, so it certainly feels like spring out there. Mm -hmm. um, thank you all for coming and most of you for speaking. Uh, we have just a couple quick items to attend to and then we'll get immediately into a comment about the proposals that are in front of us. Um, first of all, we always start our meetings off with general public comment. If there's anyone here this evening who wishes to speak about CPC in general, not in terms of the three proposals that are here probably for. But any general public comment? Okay. Moving right along, we have minutes to approve. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of January the 16th? I'll make that motion. Second? I'll second it. Uh, discussion? Chair's report, just a, a quick chair's report. I think, uh, or hopefully most people saw the uh, email that came in from um, Sarah. We've been given our official uh, Community Preservation Association match for the fiscal year 20, beginning July the 1st. Um, it's 11.57%, per I believe, of what we have uh, generated locally, which comes in around 150,000 since we tax ourselves at the highest value, remember there'll be more to come and we don't quite know what that will be. So we're short of 150,000 more to come. If folks read the morning's Gazette, the Gazette editorial spoke to this declining piece of the pie and mentioned CPC as one of those declining pieces without giving any course of action for that. Um, so that was that was interesting. Uh, Linda, any, have you found it? I have not. No? Market when you see it. Yeah, we can revisit that perhaps later. So we'll move right on into the public uh, comment session. So again, we appreciate folks coming out to speak in favor or against one of the three proposals uh, before us. Um, we appreciate that this is not always an easy thing to do, to stand with the camera on in front of a committee. So again, relax. Uh, it's, we won't grill you. We won't say anything. <laughs> We'll just listen to you and nod our heads. Um, so, uh, so thank you for doing that. When when you come up, if you could just state your name for us and where you live, that would be helpful. And then tell us how you feel. We have three proposals. One is the broader coalition looking at uh, invasive uh, species in the Fitzgerald Lake conservation area. The second is. Um, the uh, funding the nomination of National Register of Historic Places in Florence. And the third is open space acquisitions in Mineral Hills, Rocky Hills, and, and Beaver Brook. If I could just see a quick show of hands. How many folks are here for the historic designation? Can you put your hands up? Okay, for the uh, BBC invasives. Okay, and for the uh, open space acquisitions. Okay, lots of folks with that. Why don't we begin then with, uh, with Broadbrook Coalition. Um, once you say your spiel, you're invited to stay and hear the rest of your uh, neighbors speak. Um, you can leave after you, after you speak. Uh, once folks are done, time permitting, I think we will have time because there's not a whole lot of folks speaking, uh, we will go right into our deliberations in terms of looking at the three proposals in front of us. You're certainly welcome to stay for that as well. But uh, what, what, what everyone to do is, is fine with that. So let's begin with the Broadbrook proposal. Anyone want to go first there? No. 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 Don't worry, all these pages aren't my notes, some are pictures. Uh, I'm Bill Williams, uh, live at Barrett Place in Northampton. And I'm a member of the uh, Broadbrook Coalition Board of Directors. As you know, Broadbrook 
coalition is responsible for managing uh, Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area. And I probably don't need to mention it, but I will anyway, that you know, Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area is a really special place among city-owned conservation lands. It's got a lot of diverse ecosystems, lake, forest, shrubland, uh, vernal pools, swamps, thanks to the beavers, and also uh, vernal pools. And one of Broadbrook Coalition's tasks is to manage and uh, Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area and maintain its ecological integrity. And one of the major threats to that integrity uh, is invasives. Uh, and we started our invasive, invasive management program probably a couple of decades ago, first using manual labor, and I think, Brian, you were part of the initial crew that did that, went out too. And that worked for a number of years, but eventually invasives got ahead of us, employing on a manual basis. And so around 2009, we contracted out with a professional consultant to start using herbicides on a limited basis, uh, particularly in the area of the dam and uh, Cook's Pasture, where we had real, really big infestations of invasives. Uh, CPC approval of our current application uh, will enable us to continue that program. And as you know, invasive management is not a, just an open and shut or on and off basis. Uh, it really requires continual monitoring. And uh, if we stop the program, no doubt in a few years, we would see invasives come back again, populate the areas, and all our work would be undone. So I will leave you with a few pictures here there were three major species that were in our application. And I'll just hand you out these pictures. I've got two sets here. Uh, so what would happen if those species were left unmanaged? And we sure don't want FLCA to look like that. So we appreciate your consideration, and hopefully uh, there'll be a favorable outcome. So thank you. Thank you so much. Good evening, I'm Maura Bradford, I'm Mark Maple Street in Florence, and I'm one of the newest members of the Board of Directors on the Broadbrook Coalition. I just want to follow up uh, what Bill had to say with saying that with invasives, I'm sure that you can all appreciate that taking three steps backward can be a really bad thing when you're trying to manage invasive species, especially some of the plant species that we're dealing with at Fitzgerald Lake. Um, so I would just ask that you consider favorably the proposal that's before you so that we can stay on top of it and, as Bill said, preserve the integrity of the area. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anybody else for the Broadbrook proposal? Get going on that. Okay, let's move along to the uh, Quick open space acquisition, Mineral Hills, Rocky Hill, and Beaverbrook Greenways. For those of you who don't know, before us is a proposal from the city for $161,000 uh, to purchase uh, uh, quite a few acres of open space in those three areas. So, somebody want to speak to that? This is a proposal basically from the city to buy four parcels of land in very different areas of the city. And I guess my uh, first comment is preserving open land is always a good idea. But these four parcels are important in different ways. One is largely practical, and the other three are more ecological and recreational. There's a <coughs> one point, roughly one and a half acre parcel down on Route 10, just where the bike path uh, crosses Route 10 on a bridge. And uh, it's important really for practical reasons. It'll provide parking space for people who want to get on the trail at that point, and it will also provide access. And it fills in a sort of curious inholding in the uh, Rocky Hill Greenway. So <clears throat> I think that's all really good. The other three parcels are ecologically important. There's um, one in the very southwest corner of the city, which uh, was an old area of mining. Interesting that there was actual uh, mineral mining in Northampton at one time, but it was apparently profitable. 
uh, <coughs> it's on a raised area. There are some cliffs where you can get good views out of the countryside, largely to the south. And um, it's, in general, important for uh, important habitat for wildlife. Another parcel in the southwest corner is um, just off Glendale Road. And it's interesting not only because it's largely forested and good habitat for wildlife, but it, its purchase by the city will also enable um, the developer of the Wagon Tails Dog Park to go ahead with the purchase of um, additional land adjacent and construction of the dog park. And certainly, um, from the number of dogs we see in conservation areas, Northampton definitely needs a dog park. Uh, I would just like to add that um, we have been advocating also the building of a public dog park in Northampton. Uh, I'm not sure where that's going right now, but I think that's an important uh, part of the mix of areas that will be open for dogs. But anyway, the purchase of that parcel is important <coughs> for wagon tails to go ahead. The fourth parcel <coughs> is up in the northwest corner, or really the northern side of the city, and it nearly abuts two existing conservation areas. I think in one case uh, it does actually abut it, one that's been called traditionally the Beaver Brook Conservation Area, and the other is the, the Beaver Brook Greenway, which is on the um, east side of Route 9. Uh, it's about 100 acres, and the Beaver Brook Conservation Area must be in the neighborhood of 50 to 60 acres, I'm not sure exactly. So the acquisition of another 45 acres very close to those two conservation areas is important uh, in one case for uh, helping to fill in a wildlife corridor that with many gaps runs almost all the way around Northampton. And those corridors are very important for the circulation of wildlife. Uh, unfortunately, we see that from roadkill, um, <clears throat> which is all too frequent. But those corridors allow for the circulation of animals and foraging and finding mating pairs and so forth, and they're really quite critical. And having these three areas all together uh, on the Beaver Brook, close to the Mill River, is a really nice addition for the city. So, uh, so we have four parcels, four different reasons really for protecting them, and uh, I hope that the city will be able to purchase those. Thank you, Bob. My name is Kate oh, Butoff, and I work for Mass Audubon at Arcadia. I live in Greenfield. And I'm here specifically to support the Rocky Hill acquisition, which it's tactical and it's right on Route 10, but it's also part of a wildlife corridor. Um, we have a, a wildlife cam that links the Arcadia with the Rocky Hill Greenway, and we've got lots of critters that are going under the culvert there, including a family of bobcats recently. So I just um, urge you to support that by partnering with the city on that acquisition, as we have with multiple acquisitions in the Rocky Hill Greenway. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. My name is Kate. I'm actually a resident of Waitley, and I'm mostly a recreational user of these some of the land areas in and around the Sawmill Hills areas, and I just want to generally voice my support for these land acquisitions as a recreational user of the surrounding areas, particularly in Sawmill and those general areas. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, uh, Fred Bedall, live on Liberty Street, also a landowner in the Meadows, 80 acres, and uh, I also volunteer and maintain a trail in the Lake Fitzgerald Conservation Area, and I just want to speak in support of that incredible open space program in this in this city. It's just, I, I think it's like a little Marin County, and it, it makes this town so uh, livable and really stand out from, and hopefully be uh, kind of an example to other towns around. So I just hope that you'll continue the program. And just an example of this, my family, uh, my sister and her kids come up from Fairfax County, Virginia. They just can't believe it. 
I can't believe it. you can go swimming in the middle river and then you can go and sit on the dock at Lake Fitzgerald and you're you know not like in the traffic jam for like hours. So thank you very much for doing what you've done. Keep doing it, brother. Thank you. Hi, my name is Adele Paquin. Um, I'm a Hadley resident, but I was born and raised in Hampton, and um, my family owns a local business, Northampton Bicycle. Um, I don't feel super prepared to speak, but I guess I will just say I generally want to support the acquisition of open spaces, especially for recreation. Um, and it, it is wonderful that in some of the conservation areas, cycling is allowed. Um, and I think that's a really important form of recreation for a lot of people in this area, a way to get out and experience nature. I've also become uh, very involved with the Pioneer Valley uh, chapter of the New England Mountain Bike Association, and we are very interested in helping with trail maintenance. So sometimes there is a negative connotation towards mountain bikers, but I just want to voice that we are really trying to shift that and involve the community and help you take care of trails. So with uh, opening up these spaces to public use, I think there can be a lot more involvement of the public in giving back. And uh, we're organizing some trail days this year to try to do that. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Adele. <coughs> Other folks on the open space acquisitions? Okay, we did receive, and I think most of us should have gotten it in the, uh, that um, Sarah forwarded a letter in support from the Lead Civic Association. So we want to add that to our uh, folks who could not make it this evening. All right, last but uh, certainly not least, we have a proposal in front of us for 30000 uh, to work on making Florence uh, part of a national historic district regarding the Ruggles Center. Uh, and a number of people would like to speak on that. I want to start. Thank you. Hello. My name is Suzanne Love, and I live on Lyon Road with my husband, Tom Goldschneider, who is home, but they're right back cold and couldn't be here tonight. We both volunteer for the Rubble Center. Tom is um, a historian, amateur historian, who volunteers there. He's written a statement. I'll read his statement. My name is Tom Goldscheider. I'm a volunteer at the David Vogel Center. I'm speaking in support of fi funding the creation of a National Historic District in Florence. One of the things I do at the Vogel Center, Tom, is to lead small groups on walking tours around the village. I bring them around to various sites we have identified and talk about the historical significance of what happened there. I've lost count of how the number of times people of my generation have approached me after one of, on one of our walks to tell me that they grew up in Florence, attended Northampton schools, and have absolutely no inkling of this history. They knew, they knew the names of Joanna Truth, but did not know that she lived here. They learned about the movement to abolish slavery in high school and never once connected this history with their hometown. This degree of historical amnesia is stunning to me, to Tom. Sorry, I did some corrections and I'm just trying to read through what I wrote. This is important history that inspires us and informs choices we are faced with in the present day. It takes vigilance and work to help keep history alive. It would be nice to think that we could not possibly go back to forgetting again, but this is false complacency. It's so easy to collectively move on and forget and settle for pre-digested history where everything import of importance happened in Boston. This designation as a National Historic District will prevent this from happening again. This official recognition and the quality and the quality of scholarship that is behind it will create a record point that is very hard to ignore. This, this history warrants the extra effort and the expense. Future generations deserve to know what happened here so they can share in this rich, rich history as we have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Van I hope your husband feels better. <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, next person. My name is Dylan Gaffney. I live on Marshall Street in Northampton. I'm a member of the Northampton Historical Commission and I work at Forbes Library in the Local History and Special Collections Department. I'm sorry, uh, Visitors to Northampton see many things which are easily identifiable as historical. We're fortunate to have a streetscape that we preserve with many beautiful and historic structures intact. You can see the town hall, Smith College, the Academy of Music, you can see the Statue of Coolidge, visit, visit the Coolidge Museum, you can visit the homes and treasures of historic Northampton. But identifying the homes of the people who called Florence home in this historic period that we're talking about, locating their friends and their neighbors, their networks, walking these streets, not only can bring us a sense of place, but also closer to the actual historical person. Finding the details and the everyday depth of ordinary people, it's not easy. It's even harder when we look at the lives of people of color and the lives of women. Our community has demonstrated a continued passion for more information, preservation, and interpretation of the history of this area. Last fall, collaborative programs on the subject of the Underground Railroad and the abolition history of the area organized as a collaboration between the Ruggles Center, Historic Northampton, many public libraries in the area, and the Mass History Department drew huge crowds to every single event we hosted. We filled first churches. We had over 70 people and frigid walking tours on three consecutive Sundays um, last year. Uh, we showed films, we hosted multiple exhibits, and the thing that came through the clearest was that people couldn't get enough of it. The last 25 years have shown steady growth in what we know about the residents of Florence and their unique history, and I see this regularly in my work at the library where people come in hungry for more and more information. Looking back on what he found in his visits to Florence in 1844 and 1845, Frederick Douglass would remember the high thought of the men and women that led them to dare and to do startling things in contradiction to the common sense of the period. He recalled how the place and people struck me as the most democratic I had ever met. There was no high, no low, no masters, no servants, no white, no black. This designation would further establish the importance of the story to our city's history and encourage researchers, schools, libraries, and local history organizations collaborate further to ensure future generations understand and build upon what's been discovered. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Good evening. My name is John Ballard. I live on Lily Street in Florence. Uh, I am a former, uh, the original managing editor and executive editor of the African American National Biography Project at Harvard University. Um, I'm no longer, no longer with them. Started that project and, and worked on it for a number of years. Um, and in the process of, of doing that work, amongst the, as well as living in Florence, uh, I began to get a sense of how unique Florence is in terms of, uh, let's call it our national racial history. Uh, the, 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 the density of interest, both in terms of uh, actual people who lived here, David Ruggles, Sojourner Truth, uh, a number of others, uh, the, the organizations that were here, are unique in, in, the, in the concentration in such a, in such a small place as Florence, uh, but they're also incredibly important. And I wanted to speak just a, just a brief moment on the importance of and recognition of the continuity of history that that history is not important to us simply because it's really interesting and they were really great people who lived here. It's important to us because it continues to be important and it has continued to be important in, in the very same light for the past 170 years or whatever the math adds up to. Um, I am currently uh, researching and writing a book um, that I'm calling Before Rosa Parks. And it's about people who did what Rosa Parks did, that is, refused to give up their seat in public transportation or public seating um, before she did. Who is the very first person that we know of to do that? It was David Ruggles in 1834. Um, and as I 
writing this book, I suddenly discovered that there are at least three people who live in Florence who are known, or should be better known, of course, uh, for doing that very same thing. That, in, in other words, as a mode of, of, of protest and of making visible uh, the problems of racial division that we have in this country, uh, protests on forms of transportation are very important. Those are small spaces where we all get crammed together uh, and, and needs to be dealt with. Um, the fact that, that's, that such a high percentage, really, of those people uh, lived here in, in Florence is not an accident. They came because it was an amenable place to do that. Uh, the fact that, as someone commented, so many of our school children who live here now don't know that is absolutely lamentable. Uh, to, to make uh, that portion of Florence a national historic district is important, not just for Florence, not just for Northampton, uh, but for our awareness, for the awareness of the whole country, to begin to recognize that we're all in this together, and that it is that it is much more important than we ever thought it was when we were school children who didn't know much about it either. Um, I can keep going, but I won't. <laughs> Thank you very much. For taking this into consideration. Thank you, Charlie. So I'm Sarah Lennox. I live on Columbus Avenue. I'm a retired faculty member from UMass. Um, I'm on the board of Historic Northampton, and I'm a volunteer at the Ruggles Center. Um, a motto that Historic Northampton has used and that the Ruggles Center also embraces is making history present. So I'm going to echo some of the thoughts that some of the other people have had. Um, this wonderful little city of ours has a history of social justice, and we need social justice really badly right now. And especially it has a history of social justice with regard to race and gender, something also we need very badly right now. Um, I'm always shocked, as Tom is, um, how many people don't know about that history, how many people who live, who've lived in this city for a long time don't know about this city. I just came from a talk at the, I'm um, also on the Board of Northampton Neighbors, I just came from a talk at the senior center person speaking. I told him I had to leave early because I was coming to speak here um, about, on behalf of the David Ruggel Center, and he said, this is a very distinguished professor, professional in this town who didn't know who David Ruggles is. Um, I think that's kind of a tragedy um, for the history and the presence the present of this city. We need to we need people to know that. We need people to know what a wonderful city we live in and that what was done in the past continues to the present and we're helping to make sure that that's the case. I also think and I think this is also not a small consideration, that people will come to Florence if there's a National Historic District here and that will be in everyone's benefit. So I am so proud that I live in a place um, that had a utopian community in the 1840s. I'm so proud that I live in a place um, that David Ruggles came to recover from his trials in New York City. I'm so proud that Sojourner Truth lived here and that Frederick Douglass talked so, with such admiration about Florence and the utopian community and everything that was happy, happening there. I'm so happy that formerly enslaved people felt they could come here and be safe. Um, and I want everybody to know about that. Um, I think, I hope everybody in Northampton would want that to happen. So I encourage you to support this. Thank you so much, sir.
Hi, I'm Stephanie Pasternak. I live on 121 Pine Street, Florence, right by the statue, Sojourner Truth statue. And I'm also a volunteer on the David Bogles Committee, and I am a teacher, I'm a teacher at the Center for New Americans. We have talked a lot at the Bruggles Center uh, about parallels between fugitive slaves and undocumented immigrants and what they're going through here. And um, one thing that I've, um, working at the Center for New Americans, um, we focus on is that anything, we make, we do a lot of work to make a difference in the lives of, of different individual students. And the same thing happened in Florence many years ago when pe it wasn't just a matter of signing petitions, but people actually gave haven to people fleeing from um, from, sl from slavery in the, in the South. And um, I think that, that that history is so important to understand now as we reflect on today. I've had a little girl come in for a tour. She was from Ludlow, and she just came in with her grandmother. She was in fifth grade and did a report. On, the, on Sojourner Truth, and she had heard about us. And she came in, and she had never, she couldn't believe that Sojourner Truth lived there. We had a, we had a timber from Sojourner Truth's house, and, um, and I think we made her year. She was just, she was African American. She was just couldn't believe that this was living history. And I feel that this history can make an impact on, on individual lives. At the same time, living across from the Sojourner Truth statue, I see many people coming through there. I see you know, license plates from afar. I see people who live nearby walking, trickling in to see what's going on, to go on one of Steve's amazing tours. And um, I think it will, becoming a national historic district will raise the profile of the community. There are no restrictions, so there's really no downside to doing it. I think you can only bring in more people to Northampton, which is good for Northampton tourism and Florence tourism. Um, at the same time as it's doing a historic service to our nation. So, thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. <coughs> Anybody else? Can you speak? <coughs> well, uh, my name is Christopher J. Sparks. I am originally from Northampton. I grew up here, went to uh, Hill Institute, Lawrence Grammar. JFK and Northampton High School before going on to University of Massachusetts. I currently reside in Chicopee. Um, and I'm really happy to see that I'm not the only one who brought notes today for this presentation, actually. But I'm here to talk about, uh, I'm here to speak from the perspective of history that isn't always named and maintained. My work in history is at NorthamptonStateHospital.org. And if you don't know, there was a facility at one time called Northampton State Hospital upon a place called Hospital Hill that is today known as Village Hill. And it was renamed from Village Hill to Hospital Hill for marketing purposes. Funny story. My last name is Sparks. Sparks comes from an old English term for sparrow hawk but my family isn't from England originally. It was changed also to be more marketable, in fact. In South Carolina, right now, in a place called Florence, there are monuments to the Civil War. Those monuments mark places of northern occupation of the South, and not much more. In fact, the Historical Society of Florence does not do history that is not the Civil War. So if one were to say, go to South Carolina to find family history based on sharecropping, you would have a very hard time to do it. To deny a name of a thing, or to denigrate the name of a thing, is to be complicit with its erasure. I live on Clark Avenue, and I'm reading the statement of Bonnie Parsons, who couldn't be here tonight. 
she wanted me to put this before you as something in addition to her great letter in our packet. I would like to speak in favor of the funding of the Community Preservation Committee for the National Register nomination and context statement for the African American Abolition and Equal Rights National Historic District. I had the good fortune to work with the Rebel Center when as preservation planner at the Pioneer Valley Com Planning Commission, I added properties in Florence to Northampton's inventory of cultural resources. Additionally, I took University of Massachusetts graduate students to the Rebel Center so they could experience the model research skills that have brought to light so much of Florence's social history in the areas of abolition and conduct of a working community, the Northampton Association. Academically rigorous yet imaginative, the center has pulled together historical data from a period in which data was intentionally suppressed. By reading scarce extant documentation and coupling it with painstaking comparison to the built environment of 19th century Florence, the Rebel Center staff has been able to piece together Florence's role in the abolition of slavery and the lives of some of its key figures. The work has been done on a voluntary basis up until now, simply, I believe, because the number of hours required to unearth the history made it unaffordable as paid work. But now there is an unparalleled opportunity for the city to fund the creation of a National Register nomination and contact statement using the material the center has collected. Without reservation, I urge the CPC to fund this project. Northampton will be the richer for it. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else to speak? I, I, I feel a little unprepared because I didn't plan on speaking and I don't have anything written. But um, I'm for everything that was brought up tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, I, I really am supportive of this um, project to uh, uh, have this historic um, district in Florence. Um, I, my name is Nancy Childs. I'm a teacher. I teach elementary school. And um, I first went on a walk with Steve, who's a wonderful guide, and learned about the history of the area through the David Ruggles Center. And I bring my classes there. We study the Underground Railroad. And there is nothing more profound to, than to go to a place where Sojourner Truth lived. She bought her own house here. Um, to go and stand underneath the white pines where Frederick Douglass gave his speech and be there with a group of children, to go to David Ruggle, by David Ruggles' house. I mean, it's just, it just makes history alive for these kids. And, and to have this, um, you know, become a historic district would be just an incredible thing for Northampton. It's just, uh, I can't say enough uh, good things about it, so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? One once. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Okay. I'm Chris Metcalf. <coughs> Excuse me. I sent a letter that was late. I don't know if you got it. I'll be very brief. I just would like to add. <clears throat> to the things that have been said, that this is really an, almost an international issue. The whole world, I mean, it, it suffers from the problems of, you know, misunderstanding race and so forth. And so we've gone through slavery and Jim Crow, and, and still today, uh, around the world, there is a great need for education when it comes to the history of race. And, and how human beings treat each other. And I just wanted to expand this to more than just importance in Florence. Thank you. I'm, uh, I, I'm at 142 Main Street in Northampton. My name is Doron Goldman. I live uh, on Cherry Street in Northampton. Uh, I wasn't planning on saying anything, but I just want to add my support to this historic designation. I myself am a Negro Leagues researcher, and I research the process of baseball integration. And I'm trying to help bring attention to this very important part of our history at a difficult time 
uh, with regard to race in our country. And I think this is a commendable effort. I've been to the Rebel Center several times, done tours with Tom Goldscheider, and I think it's a fabulous place, and it's just something that should be supported. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? We had going once, going twice last time. It popped up, so. <laughs> Uh, one more time, one once, going twice. <clears throat> okay, again, thank you all for uh, speaking so eloquently and passionately about uh, one or more of the three projects before us. Um, you can stick around if you'd like. We have one item before us, one agenda item, uh, and then we will have an opportunity as a committee to begin funding recommendations for this round. So again, if we want to take a quick little break here for folks who want to leave. Uh, let's do that for us to construct. Uh, and again, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank Murphy's Realtors. It looks just like the guy. Oh, thanks. Yeah. 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 What's in a drawer? Next time, I'll send you one thinking about science. I thought that was such a good point about the genius. Oh, yeah. 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 Very resonated and made me think what could happen in Florence. Because we're not. I gotta get to, I don't have my corporation to go for my tour tomorrow. Oh. They have a to, to someone I know. Emma Silverman? Yeah. My daughter's class. Oh, oh your daughter's at Smith? No, but they take classes at Smith at the awesome. high school, and she's in that class. She's going to come? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, yeah. So I got to sure go put my... Fine. I didn't know that was the teacher, so she just randomly is taking this art history class. Uh -huh. It was that yes. professor, and she yeah, said, so, oh... So, yeah, Emma wants me to think of, you know, but when you have... Sit on City Hall, you know, Gothic okay. Revival City Hall, that's art, right? Yeah, and you're going to talk about that. Are you talking about, what are you talking about? Well, wait, I'm just doing the, the same tour that I did for Forbes Library. Okay. I call it UGRR okay. West. Awesome. West East. Yeah, yeah, that's great. This is the West one. Awesome. Well, it has to be the West one. And, and the great one for Smith and Tresson. Yeah. Going to the courtyard between Mary Ellen Chase House and Duffet House. Uh-huh, yeah. Where William O'Reilly Yeah, 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 I know, yeah. Yeah, we have Where uh, her husband husband play the accordion loud and drown out his prayer. Yeah. 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 So yeah, so it's just like the rest of them, where it kind of progresses. Now I have documents to go with each site, plus images. Yeah. Like, can have reading better. Yeah. Well, so how you been doing? Oh, I know, I'm so busy, but I did meet with them about the brother yeah, for sure. Nice to meet you. We're going to get back. I did come like out to tonight, so that's good. Uh, I was like, I didn't have a speech. No, I was here. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry to be so raucous. Yeah, you encourage us. <laughs> 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 I'd like to Okay, there was a motion and a second to approve the minutes. There was discussion looking at a typo, and Linda has found that. Linda, because your very words on um, the chair's report, it's the sentence that starts by an informal committee that matching grants for conservation of accessibility and projects to the comma. So there will be additional funds. I think there's just a few words. We're not consistent. Thank you for picking that up. I got distracted. Any other? 
comments on the uh, agenda? Okay. George, we're voting on the agenda. Linda, fire on her missing words. Oh, the minutes okay? The minutes are okay? Uh, all those in favor? Okay, great. Um, so before we begin our funding recommendations, there's been a request that we should receive, again by email, uh, to uh, have a six month extension from historic Northampton uh, for the balance of just about $5,000, uh, $4,965. Um, it should have expired this month, but they are requesting that be moved for another six months. Um, perhaps some of you are able to look at the, sh the slideshow for the PowerPoint presentation. Did people get those? I wasn't, that was too big. I could have sent it, but it, um, it, it is online. It, yeah. it's okay. a project folder if anybody wants to do it. Um, I was able to get it, I don't know how I picked it up. But anyway, it's really impressive when you look at the sort of the, the then and now mm -hmm. pictures that Lori, et cetera, has have, uh, have put together. Uh, so there should be a motion, uh, if we can hear it, to um, request an extension or to agree to an extension of six months to historic Northampton to expend to uh, expend the remaining balance of four thousand nine hundred sixty-five dollars and ninety-five cents. Is there a motion? Yes, I'd move to approve the extension for six months. A second. Second. Discussion. So being a newbie on the board lately, is this a somewhat common thing if somebody comes forward and they haven't expended the money? Or is this a first? Are we setting a precedent for other groups? Um, we're certainly not setting a precedent. Is it common? No. Uh, it happens. It happens. Yeah. Yeah, it, it happened happen with so. the yeah, gardens, yeah. Um, uh, the, the courthouse. It, it happened. It's happened before. It's yes. more common actually with city applicants, but those don't. But when it happened, we usually looked for some some evidence of their spending that money in good faith. And I mean, this letter is a lot of evidence. Sure. Yeah. So yeah. I know I feel really confident with their ability to spend their remaining four thousand nine hundred dollars. I would certainly encourage people to go online and look at look at the thing that Lori <coughs> presented because it really is impressive. I mean, I, you know, the, again, then and then and now it's like, oh my goodness. You look at how the collections were housed. You look at some of the building work had gone um, really neglected for, for years and years. Sure. And just, in my opinion, been such an <coughs> impressive turnaround mm -hmm. in the last number of years, particularly in the last couple of years. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm totally in favor of this application, this request, but I, I'm just, again, interested, have, do applicants ever turn back money to the CPC because they've been unable to finish their projects? or Yes, or the project has come in uh, over there, and yeah. they've had stuff. The first church's windows was not, they didn't use all their money, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we're certainly on the verge of getting 100000 back from the courthouse, and then the shit hit the fan, and bricks were falling, and <laughs> now look at it. Right? It's just encompassed with that cool scaffold there. Mm -hmm. So I think we're a month shy of 100000 100, But no, it occasionally doesn't happen. Any other comments on this? So the motion on the floor is to approve the six-month extension to historic Northampton. All those in favor? All those opposed? So it passes unanimously. Uh, I apologize. One thing I neglected to mention while folks were here is Sarah also sent out, which we you may have read, three additional letters of support for the Ruggles uh, Center from uh, the group Emerging America, from uh, Metcalf Associates and from Barbara Blumenthal. Uh, the three of them could not be here, so that was three more to add to the folks who spoke. How are we doing time-wise? What is it, 10? 10 up, 8? So moving right along, um, I think if time allows, it says, but it seems like time has allowed for us to, us to move. As we remember, may remember in the past, we've done the shopping, shopping cart uh, process. Uh, there's been a suggestion by Linda that we leave our shopping cart in the aisle and just go proceed <laughs> right, to, right to check out with three proposals. Uh, I'd ask Sarah, and Sarah, I don't know if you're able to do this, 
just a quick update before we begin on proposals that are in process. Uh, just might be helpful for us to, to know. So are these things that, that we expect to come the next round? Or no, I thought it was that things that were that are, that are still in the that are still happening, uh, like um, dial self and on half. Okay, um, so so dial self was able to keep going over the winter. They clarified what was going on there, and they submitted an invoice for the full amount, which we'll be able to pay. So, and they do not expect to return for additional CPA funds. Other projects in the works that we have. That all of the small grants will be going before city council for first, first reading tomorrow. Uh, so I don't know the status of those. But everybody else is spent out? Oh, just grants in general. Everybody seems to be moving forward. Um, I, I haven't identified any issues with people installed grants. Great. No. Good. no big amounts of money expected to come back. Any questions for Sarah about existing proposals? Or not proposals, but existing grants. And if, if anybody has particular questions or wants an update on any specific project, feel free to let me know. And I can prepare something for getting or ask, ask the applicant to return. I am interested, though, in the question you didn't ask, which is what you've heard about um, future submissions. Um, Wayne has a few um, acquisitions. What? In, 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 uh, um, I know Habitat for Humanity will be coming in, and I'm, I'm not. I'm sorry, but uh, Habitat for Humanity will be coming in. At some point, the Historic Commission will be coming back with uh, both a request for the uh, State Hospital Memorial Park and the deferred request for um, a preservation plan, and that, that's all I'm aware of at this point. The Habitat is for. Uh, lots on the Burt's Pit, I believe. So the the lots were um, permanently, or I think a 99 year restriction with CPA funds, but this is for actual creation of the housing on those lots. It was an interesting, the people, people read the letter to the editor about the Burt's Pit. Yeah. yeah. Um, supportive of the idea, but not but um, upset with the process. Yeah. So the lots that that was referring to weren't actually a part of the yeah. CPA award. So the um, the Burt's, Burt's Bog and Affordable Housing Project set aside three lots to be, um, to have an affordable housing restriction on them and the protection of about 100 acres. Both of those have been done. There were additional market rate lots that were part of the larger project. And the letter referred to those lots. There was a proposal from a, a, the developer of Emerson Way to move the, the homes that he was required to create to Burt's Bog Road. But that's not actually really related to either of the CPA projects. Good to know. Any other questions about those things? Okay, let's see what we can do tonight. Um, I don't know if people want to go in particular order. Do you? Or, or, are you here for? I'm specific? here to learn. Just ignore me. I'm just here listening, learning. Okay. Okay. Um, so I thought I don't know. Maybe go from smallest in amount to largest if that makes sense. So let's begin with the, if people are okay with that, we'll begin with the BBC proposal for the invasive removal at um, Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area. Move reallocate 6950 for removal of invasives at uh, the uh, Fitzgerald Lake, uh, wherever it is. That one. <laughs> Second, that one. <laughs> Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area. Um, is there a second? Oh, we have a second. I'm sorry. Discussion? So, uh, this is not directly related, but um, there's been some discussion um, recently about a city led, I don't know what it is, on the use of, um, um, use of herbicides. Does anybody have anything better for me about what, what so quite a big is. article in yesterday's paper, wasn't it? Yeah, I had It's had about the reduction of, of current levels of use, but there's no clear, this is what we're going to do as yet. So I, I thought it was to form an right. exploratory committee to look in. That's how can we reduce it? it? 
Yeah. So second reading of, of that order will be tomorrow. So it's a resolution establishing a, collect, a select committee on pesticide reduction. Um, so that will, uh, the city council of North Hampton will establish a select committee on pesticide reduction. City council president shall appoint up to eight members of the committee by April 12th or approve two members of the city council and up to six residents who possess expertise in the professional field of agriculture, recreation, forestry, turf management, organic and or integrated pest management, land care, conservation, public health, or other related fields. So I guess they, they'll study pesticides in general, but specifically related to city uses. Okay, so that was my question. Is it is it is related to use by the city or use in the city? And it sounds like it's by the city. And it, it seems like it's by the city um, primarily because that's mostly what the, so I, what the city would be able to regulate, but the, also yeah, just looking at the, the reason I'm getting at that is because um, people who we fund would technically be by the city, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. So I've seen, talking, they are talking about pesticides, right, not herbicides. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, so it's, it's just pesticides and not herbicides. So it's, uh, let's see, it references, I, I think it's, it's intended to be all sorts of chemicals, but it does specifically it's say pesticides. pesticides. Okay. And the yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But the council order um, references a sustainable Northampton goal to reduce use of toxic substances, including pesticides, herbicides, high VOC paints, and other listed toxic so that would be worth us being in yeah. touch with, yeah. with those folks. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you, Chris, for bringing that up. Yeah. So I would say also that, you know, the Broadbrook Coalition, those folks have done a, since 2009, I think they told us, you know, they've done a, a very good job of being mindful about the application of the herbicide. So they also, I would think because so many of them are come from a, a science academic background, they've got good data on what they've been doing, will probably be a great resource for the city as unfortunately we move forward towards more herbicide kind of an invasive treatment. So I, I think it's good for them to keep doing it under you know the watchful eye that they have. Because I know from our rail trail experience, we want to do some things that keep down the invasives there too, and we're not quite sure how to do that. So I think the Broadbrook can be a really good mentors and a resource around that. So mm -hmm. for that reason too, I, I'd like to continue funding that organization. I actually have a comment because I took a training that was partly sponsored by Broadbrook Coalition in handling invasive plants and especially Japanese knotweed, and they don't spray. They weren't, they were not spraying. They were using Roundup or glyphosate, but they cut off the plant, and they have this little dauber thing with a, kind of a, you, know, you, you put a little bit of this stuff with dye in it, and you daub it on after you cut off the plant, so that you can see that you've got it there, and if you get it somewhere else, you can rinse it off. It's not like they're spraying it all over. They're really being careful about how they do it. And just in case you're worried about too much. Okay. Thank right. you. Other comments? Yeah, uh, I just, just to clarify, I, I don't. I didn't raise that because I had concerns about this project. I think George is right to point out that you know, yeah. Uh, these guys, these, this group does seems to do it as as well as it can be done, and I I, I like funding their projects because uh, they are able to leverage our dollars with volunteer work and get so much out of. of it, it, I mean, not just a, a, you know eradication of invasives, but every time we give them money, we get massive bang for the buck. So I I don't have any problem with that. I just um, you know this is something that we're going to have to continue to address, and clearly. The city is is looking at, at at resident concerns about this stuff. So I just, I, I, as you point out, I think it's important that, that it stay on, on our on our screen. I would nominate Chris to be on the committee. On the committee. <laughs> I don't think I yes. have favor. I don't think I have patience for that. That's perfect. I have one comment. I um, 
every year I attend a conference at U UMass that is hosted by the Ecological Landscape Alliance, the organization. And this year they had an entire um, panel discussion about glyphosate. So I couldn't miss that, right? Um, and the, what was very interesting about it is that um, the science and the points of view about it are really all over the place. For example, one of the panelists was the toxicologist for the state of Maine. And um, she, you know, she points out, I think rightly so, that we have a lot of risk in our world. You know, 12,000 people die every year falling downstairs. Um, so you have to look at it on a spectrum, especially if the science is not definitive at this point. Um, so just, you know, that said, I think that uh, I would support this application knowing this, um, that if it's used in, in a uh, controlled way, I think the risk will be minimized and it'll probably be less than falling downstairs every year. So, um, yeah. Right. We don't want to fund the stairs project. Yeah. <laughs> well, she said, you know, you can't like alter all the stairs so people can't right. fall down them. So, yeah. Any other discussion on this? Are we ready to vote? Okay, all those in favor of the proposal to allocate $6,950 to the BBC for the invasives. All those opposed. Okay. Not in the sharp shopping cart, but through the checkout. Uh, moving along to the uh, uh, David Ruggles uh, Center for the National. Uh, historic district in the village of Florence. Can someone make a motion for this? Um, I'll move that we vote to um, award thirty thousand dollars to the David Rebel Center for the um, writing of the nomination for the National Register for the Second. African American Coalition and Equal Rights District in Florence. Second. So, second. Okay. Um, Sarah, can you just remind us one more time what our set aside is for historic preservation? Set aside is 64 dead. Okay, so if we spend 30 on this, does six and the 64, forgive me for forgetting, include the 3,000 from our uh, small grants? It does, so that, that's after. That's after that. That's assuming it's been funded by. Okay, so 64, which will give us 34 carryover into the next fiscal year. Have I got that? Okay. And 34 that we couldn't spend, not that we have to reach out. Great. Okay, discussion about this? I think we shouldn't fund them so that they could represent because they were so articulate and so interesting. <laughs> and I'd like to hear them all one more time. But I agree. <laughs> I wish that the one gentleman said I could go on. It's like yeah. I was kind of like, don't worry. Right. I'm very excited to, to fully fund this. It's just, it's so much hard work, so much, and it's so wonderful, it's so needed. I just can't imagine why we wouldn't want to do that. I, I would, uh, piggyback on what you're saying, Linda, I would, um, for myself, the most interesting committee meeting that we have is this one where people give their public input yeah. mm -hmm. and how. And some people can tell are very nervous. I mean, they're you know very anxious getting up. Um, but people are so articulate and passionate and committed and uh, knowledgeable about the topics. It's we really live. And someone went on. I think one of the the women that the uh, UMass person went on and on about what a wonderful town we live in, and it's really true. It's quite quite a treat to hear people speak. Uh, more discussion on this? Uh, I, I, my only comment was, of course, I support this very much, but I, I'm wondering if there's a way we can encourage, um, you know, the 30,000 is just going to cover the work that has to get done to get this done, because it is a big project. Um, encourage the Ruggles Center, um, whomever, to um, try to uh, get some press coverage about this and get some mileage out of it. I don't know. We, have a, we can suggest that to them. Maybe a repeat application to come back to do some public programming around it. I don't know. Um, I would just like to see that because I think it was the kind of thing you don't want to get have get lost and not um, 
recognized. I would just I would just follow up on what Martha said. To my only re regret, and it's not a reservation. My only regret about this proposal is that it doesn't it doesn't present you with a clear next step. And yeah. I think we I think you, it. You know, I've now in the space of two months had this conversation 20 times, which is I had no idea. And it, it came up here, you know, I, I was born and raised in Northampton. I went to grade school. I didn't go to public school, but I went to grade school here. Nothing. Nothing. You know, I mean, I understand that history curriculum is probably generated in some community far, far away, but I think, I think it's incumbent on us as a community to make sure that, you know, we educate ourselves at the very least about this, and and so I, you know, I don't know how we go about encouraging them to come back, um, but I, um, other than have a conversation with Steve, which is, you know, come back. Um, I mean, I think that's certainly something the historical conversation, historical commission, I, we should take that on as a responsibility to, you know, work with them to make that happen. So I'm, I'm happy to take that back to the commission, um, but it's really, it's really, really. But I, I just, after the week after we went, um, I they did a walking tour that I tagged along with them. It was, a, it was me and a dozen UMass students who are not from this area, but are, are Massachusetts red, predominantly Massachusetts residents, and they, they, were, they were just thrilled to realize that this was happening, you know, right here. Um, and if we're not, if we're not, and and. Steve's like, yeah, please come back as often as you want. He had been over there on Wednesday and gave lectures, and the students were just thrilled to come over here and, and walk around. And, you know, this is this is a gem in the rock, and we I, this is the kind of thing where I think you know I, I like to see my Chris Owen CPA money spent this way. <laughs> so, you know. My understanding is that the next step is to submit this to the state. I mean, mm -hmm. we are paving the way, or they're preparing a nomination form. So there is a, a next step. Yeah, I mean, is, even beyond that, yeah. I mean, I'm talking about you know post designation, assuming yeah. that it's going to happen. And I can't, yeah. I can't, for the life of me, imagine why it wouldn't. Other than this is a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an area proposal rather than a building proposal. Um, but you know, I don't know how you, I don't know how you don't approve something. Sure. Yeah, I support it as well, and I actually would say that I really trust the David Ruggles Center. They've done so much with not a lot in the last years, and I'm pretty sure that their board has many ideas for the next step, especially if they can get this proposal off and get it approved. And I would easily imagine that we'll see more than just walking towards when this gets approved. Good point. Thank you. So uh, one thing to know is that it does take time to get national yeah. registered districts and sure. nomination through the state, and then of course the National Park Service is the final approver approval body. Um, so there's time, I think, in the process of putting this nomination together to think about that. Yeah. But if we could just maybe send a message to, I would be embarrassed sending a message to Steve, and then I guess to the historical commission to follow up. So, so this is a. 62 week proposal. So, this yeah. just laying the groundwork for the proposals over here. And then, how long do you think? I mean, is it years? Um, well, it, a lot of it depends on the Massachusetts uh, State Historic Preservation Office, um, that's Mass Historical Commission's reviewing schedule. They're the ones who tend to slow things down. So, um, once they've reviewed it, then it does not take long to get approval in Washington. And I will say, Mass Historical, even though they're very slow, they do have a really good record of getting nominations approved once they've been reviewed by the state. And they, they sail through Washington. It's like 30 days. So, wow. so that's good. But it, it could take some time. And, and some time could be years or no? Um, yeah, I've been involved in projects that have taken a couple of years. Yeah. So, but. I know the consultants that have um, are going to be doing this have done a lot of work, legwork up front. <clears throat> so I think for them, it's going to be a lot of compiling the information they already have put together. They have to take photographs of everything and map it, um, and do some other narrative work. That probably will happen pretty quickly. But it's it's kind of a state review that takes a while. 
Other discussion? Are we ready to vote? So the proposal on the floor is three thousand dollars to the Douglas Center to uh, advocate for or do the groundwork for natural historic district. All those in favor? All those opposed? Okay. Number two. My goodness, it's going to be a record, isn't it? Let's get bogged down on this one. So last but not least is the four acquisitions. Open space acquisitions from the city. Is there a proposal? Uh, a motion? Move to fund for $161,000 for the three open space acquisitions. Is there a second? Second. Four. 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 Four acquisitions. Yeah. Second. I think we already got a second. I think. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, Discussion on this. Um, people feel comfortable. Let's go to the budget real quick. People feel comfortable with the uh, $50,000 for the 1.7 acres, that very small acquisition. And that's the only one that stands yes. out to me is um, making me fiscally anxious. Uh, I understand, I think Bob Zimmerman speaking sort of presented in a way that this is important for parking and, and accessibility onto the site. Um, and it's a wildlife corridor. It's also, yeah, it's yeah, also a corridor. corridor. Yeah. Okay. Just wanted to make sure that we feel comfortable with that much money for that small A parcel. I, this, okay. As I recall, this is considerably below what the yeah. acquisition yeah. price was. It is road, yeah. key road frontage, right? Right there yeah. on right. Uh, 10, yeah. correct? Yeah. Right next to the, is it next to the bridge? Mm -hmm. and the, the bridge? It is, yeah, yeah, it's right just below that bridge. Yeah. And the adjoining properties are still available to be developed. Yeah. So they'll go for a much higher price if something does get to and right, it's the kind of the beachhead for this rail spur, which is really important to get up to that other part of North Hampton. So, it's, uh, good. so I have one question in general. When Wayne uh, <coughs> presented to us, he talked about he has eight parcels that he's gonna buy. At this go around, he's only looking for CPC funding for four of them. Three others are in the Sawmill Hills, and then there's another one. So I, I just want to make sure that that happens, that then, because he could then come back to us in the next round and say, well, now I need the funding for these three parcels in Sawmill Hills, right? Who are you watching, George? Could? He might approve you. <laughs> but you know what? He also has done a great job on private fundraising. And, and has made lots of acquisitions. You know, beyond the acquisitions he makes with funding from, from, the, from the CPA, he makes other acquisitions. So, but you'll be back. Sure, sure. No, right. so I, I just, Every time. somehow we want to keep those parcels in mind. I don't know yeah. if we labeled them, or I don't know if they're, they're not named here in this yeah. application, so. When he did his presentation <clears throat> the two weeks ago, I think he had a map that had all eight on it. Um, it wasn't part of this, but he does have it. Does, yeah. 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 Sarah, can you speak to that? And can you also tell us where? So, when we don't fund projects, where's that money coming from? Uh, various sources, depending on the particular acquisition. Um, sometimes it's private fundraising, sometimes it's the APR program, with, um, which is the case for two of those parcels, but uh, each one is different. So the funding is available for it, is is in place for them. Yes, definitely. Wayne um, Wayne would not cross the funding source off the table if he needs to do that. So he won't be back for them. I think the city's actually closed on one of them already. Wow. Wow. Right. So that it is a literally a done deal. All four of them. Um, as much as anything can be before we actually close the dotted line. I mean, a landowner could change their mind or back out, which has happened before. They are also to go with other funding sources. A couple of them were, I thought, estates where the yeah. heirs were unknown. 
Oh, right. That's yeah, right. They, Mom was yeah. landlocked yes. over that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other discussion on this proposal? Are we ready to vote? Okay, so the proposal on the table is $161,000 for open space acquisitions to the city. All those in favor? All those opposed? My goodness. <laughs> yes, isn't, it, isn't that nice? So let's see, what, what is our totals again? Can someone do the math real quick? 161,000 plus. Uh, so Thirty thousand. What's that? One nine one nine seven nine five zero. Yeah. One nine what? One nine seven. Hundred ninety-seven thousand. So three eighty-eight minus one ninety-seven is what? Almost one ninety-eight. Right. Okay. Call it one ninety-eight uh, minus. I'm sorry. Uh, Two eighty-eight minus one ninety-eight. Was that ninety thousand? One eighty-five. I'm going to wait till Sarah does it. <laughs> no, it's not. No, we had, we had, we had 288,000, right? 195,000. Fiscal year 2019. Correct. 288,000. Yeah. So, what, so what's 288 minus 195? 197, you mean? Yeah. 197,950. Great, thank you. 9,000. 64 of which is historic. 64 of which we are carrying over as designated historic. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's 34. That's 34. Right, 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 and we will update it. Don't say it too loud. I was <laughs> right, he's probably listening. So. Oh! <laughs> oh, that there's extra money. Yeah. yeah. There's way out. And no, those figures the, took the into account the small guys? grants that are going Correct. in front of conservation. Yeah. Yeah. All right. right. So that's uh, up to date. All right, so <laughs> we're moving in with a little bit of money. We know the 150 coming in from the state, and yeah. generally quite a bit, not quite a bit more, but enough to. About half of that it's, more, is that what it's mean? impossible to say. Impossible. It's impossible. It could be zero more, it could be more. Does anyone don't know. remember the percentage from the state in last fiscal year or 2019? Mm -hmm. yes. 1157, this and for 2020, was it somewhat close to that? And yeah, it's pretty close. Yeah. None of that casino money is coming in there. Oh. You see that marijuana money? It's not? Uh, not to us. Wow. Well, last year it was 24. Wow. Wow. So that was with all the. Yeah, that took into account the. That was with the. Oh, okay. That, that. okay. Yeah. And That's, we don't know what that will be. It's down considerably from our 102 prison. Yeah, right. Those were the days. Wow. Those were the days. All right, well, we got three proposals in and three proposals funded and four small grants and four small grants funded. Uh, moving right along, is there other business not foreseen when agenda was published? Uh, George? Could we just look at that calendar that Sarah gave us a while yes. ago about the rest of the, uh, the spring? Um, we have a meeting plan for two weeks from today. Which is April the what? Third. April third. Just look at the orders. Yeah. So we so, could yeah, so the, the theoretically be done on that meeting. Is that correct? Um, you can orders will go through. Um, will there be other agenda items on that April third meeting? Uh, there should be. Yeah. So April 3rd, uh, I think we have a meeting scheduled for the 14th, uh, 17th, right? Um, that was really the backup meeting anyway. Right. So we don't, that's also I think it's for the parlor room for the 17th. So. It's at the parlor room in the 17th. It's the um, <laughs> secret system. We've seen before that we we'll hope that uh, we don't meet, but it's always a pleasure to meet. Uh, so any other business? Is there a motion to adjourn? 
Yeah. Okay. Second. And we're all oh. here. Wow.